So once again, that's Joshua 24, verses 14 through 18. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshiped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord, our God himself, who brought us and our parents out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in this land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Morning, Waterdam. I'm going to back this up. You tell me when my face hasn't got that uh, weird glow on it. Is that better? Like, I was like getting scared there for a while. I, I didn't know quite how to do it, whether to move the uh, trays where the reflection was coming up and hitting CJ or, or move the pulpit. So hopefully that helps uh, get things started out here. It's good to be with you. Uh, we had a, a good rest over at the Chesapeake Bay and got to go see... Uh, George Washington's house and uh, see all the beautiful woodwork that was original to the house. Had the original floors in the one section of the house that you're not allowed to walk on. Uh, a guy tried to move around when we were there to the back of it and the lady goes, nope, 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 not allowed back here, not allowed back here. And uh, it's just funny to watch people uh, as they move around this house. He actually has a key in his, where he hung it, in the original position that he hung it from Lafayette uh, when they got rid of the Bastilles over in France, and uh, I believe I'm speaking right, um, but he gave him an, a key and Washington hung it on the wall uh, as we walked into this entranceway, uh, right above this doorway, near this doorway, and it's still sitting there. They encased it. It's just amazing to see that, like that key sitting there uh, and thinking about these people and seeing the beds and, and everything that they, they slept on and the things that they, they used to do. Uh, and, and the amount of fish that he caught out of the Potomac was a massive amount. You can go read about it. But we had a wonderful time of seeing history before our very eyes unfold. And uh, we went on the National uh, Treasure Tour, which is where they talked about the movie National Treasures with uh, Nicolas Cage and showed us all the places in the movie where they, where they went down into the basement. And they were fascinated with the basement and where they shot it and all this kind of stuff. So it was interesting um, to, to go see, and we learned a lot about the place, but mainly we got to rest and just have some downtime. So we want to continue to thank you for your prayers and your love pouring out for us and for my mom and my sister. We just want to say that we love you. We appreciate it. Um, uh, please uh, keep uh, Sue Miller in your prayers as uh, her mom went home to be with the Lord yesterday. So please pray for her. Let's pray right now. Father God, we thank you for our time today. As we complete Joshua this morning and take our communion, we're reminded of your promises that your power and your presence was with us and that we have the comfort of Jesus Christ who loves us uh, so much that he died for us. He died for our sins, that you loved us so much that you sent him for us and that we can have forgiveness of our sins, that we can be forgiven of our sins. We can have the hope of heaven, eternal life. Lord, we pray for each one here today that you would just be with them as we think about the blessings that Joshua reminds the people of, that we are also reminded of the blessings that we stand in today, that we are given the redemption that you promise us. That's what the communion is about. We thank you, Lord, for the providence that you protected the people, you persevered with the people. We thank you for your promises which in this book, in this chapter, before Joshua chapter 23, it says not one of them fails. That we can rest on them and that we can finish well. So Lord, as we come to you now, as we think about our culture and how we're supposed to function and be a, be a light in a dark world, we ask, Lord, for your help for those things. We pray for your comfort for those that have lost loved ones. We pray for health and, and uh, wellness for those that are sick. 
We pray for those that are spiritually needing your comfort, needing your help today, Lord, to come close to them. As we look at Joshua, we're reminded of that, that you've given us navigational fixed points that we can, we can navigate through, that we can find our way, and that you'll go with us. We ask, Lord, that you would help us through these times in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today's uh, chapter, I wanted to read something that I came across a long time ago. Um, it's called The Resolute Desk. has been used by many American presidents in the Oval Office of the White House. It was a gift in 1880 from the United Kingdom and was made from the timbers of the HMS Resolute. You can go read about that at another time. But the desk is massive. Um, it weighs 1,300 pounds. Can you imagine moving that on moving day? You wouldn't want to move it. And it was originally a partner's desk with open key knee holes on both sides. And one of the most iconic pictures of John Kennedy's presidency shows the president's small son, John Jr., John Jr. peeking out of the knee hole while his father, the president, worked at the desk. The leader of the free world allowed his son to play at his feet. Beneath his desk, while he conducted matters of state. As amazing as that is, believers in Christ have an even greater privilege. We are invited into the throne room of God. At any time, with boldness to present our prayers to our Heavenly Father. God invites us to come confidently, to come often to his throne of grace and find grace and mercy in our time of need. That's a powerful thing to think about, that God allows us to come into his throne room, to interrupt his day, to reach to him at any moment in our life as we walk forward. I was thinking about Joshua and uh, his life and how he begins, because the way he begins is, is uh, something that is important for us to think about. Because whenever the Lord gives us a task and he assigns us something, it's not always easy, but he equips us to do the task. He doesn't always call the equipped. He equips those who he calls. And so Joshua is equipped. Richard DeHaan writes that he gives us what we need to carry it out when he calls us. Wesley wrote, among the many difficulties of early ministry... My brother Charles often said, if the Lord would give me wings, I'd fly. And I used to answer, if God bids me fly, I will trust him for the wings. Today, we finish our series on the book of Joshua, entering the promised land. We are in Joshua 24. And this is the last address that Joshua would give the people. It's a pivotal moment. Who would pick up the mantle? Can you imagine how the people would be feeling about his departure. He's 110 years old. He's lived a long life. And so who would pick up the mantle? Well, Joshua faced that same situation, if you remember, as we think about him. Who would follow Moses? Moses had died, and God chose Joshua. Joshua was thrust into the position of great responsibility. No doubt the enormity of it would challenge any of us, and it would challenge Joshua. It made him tremble with fear. If you remember, the Lord told him in the first chapter to be brave, to be strong and courageous, or courageous if you're from Pittsburgh. But we know that God said, why did God say that to him? God said, I will go with you. As I was with Moses, I will go with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Joshua 1.5, and then he said, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and good courage. Do not be afraid, nor, do, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. As you faithfully do your part, God will do his part. God gives Joshua some very important navigational points of reference. Now, I say that intentionally because one of the things, as, as I face this new, new normal for my life and the loss of my father, I had him for 58 years, and I realized that's a blessing, and, and that he lived 91 years. But it's never enough. It's never enough. But, but one of the things that we know Scripture, and we know what God says about heaven, and we have all those promises, but sometimes it, 
it starts to feel a little bit like you're out on the sea with no reference point. I found myself there. I found myself thinking about Joshua as Joshua heard that Moses died. That had to be a shock to that people, those people. Think about how much they relied on him, that God used Moses so powerfully to lead them, to watch over them, to care for them. And all those years that he walked with them through the wilderness, Joshua and Caleb are the only two that survived out of the wilderness experience, were with him. And what that would be like to lose someone like that in your life. And so it would cause some dissonance in your life. It would cause you to need to have some reference points. And so as we think about it, Joshua starts out with helping and being appointed to this around 20 years old. So some of you are younger than 20, but you can think about that, like how old you were and what you were doing. But it's interesting to hear what Joshua is told. In Joshua 1.8, it says, The book of the law shall not depart. If you want to turn back there, we're going to look at the beginning so we have the, the end in mind of how he finishes. But God tells him in Joshua 1.8, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. This is a very important navigational point for Joshua. But you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. And I thought about that as I was thinking about what I'm going through, and the kind of how it gets a little bit like you're feeling like you're out there in the ocean, and if you've ever been way out in the ocean, there's no reference points to navigate. And before GPS, there was no way of referencing other than shooting the stars with a sextant for those navigational points. And so what... Joshua is told is the book of the law is what's important, that you need to keep it in your mouth. It shouldn't depart from you. As a matter of fact, the NIV has, it shouldn't, you should keep it on your lips. And so it should be a part of you. It should be inside of you. Well, I had the word of God, but I was convicted here because like Joshua is told to not let it go. He should meditate on it day and night. And so that you may be careful to do according all that is written, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So you'll find your way. Prosperous meaning that you'll be successful in God's mission. And so as we think about that, what shapes your life? What is God saying to you today? What shapes your life? Is it the word of God? What shapes your values in weakness and in trial? What keeps you strong? What shapes your values in Failure and fortune. I heard a guy, uh, I can't remember do the doctor that was speaking to a class at Taylor University, and he asked these questions. And I was thinking about it. That's so true. He says, you will face giants in the land, just like Joshua. And Joshua was about to face those giants. What kind of giants? There's battles to face. There's relational battles, whether you're at work or whether you're in your neighborhood with your, with your friends and neighbors. Or there's, there's people around all the time to help you out on the highway to tell you where to go and stuff. But those are all battles. And you face them on a regular, better, uh, regular uh, day, every day, in and out of the week. There's financial struggles. We hear a lot about, talk a lot, a lot about that lately. We hear health concerns. We have marriage battles sometimes. Melissa and I have been married for 28 years. We have, we have disagreements every once in a while. Intense communication, Right? And so there's all kinds of battles like that. And so what God says is that you need the book of the law. Don't depart from that and meditate on the word. Don't let it leave your lips. To meditate means to turn over God's word in your mind and your heart, to examine it, to compare it. Scripture with scripture, to feed on it. It's wonderful truth. In this day of noise and confusion, such meditation is rare but so needful. Meditation is facilita facilitated by memorization. I remember when I, was, I told you I was praying, I didn't know what to pray, and I, that Romans 8 passage came to me, that God will be there, the Spirit will help me in my weakness. He, he brought that to my mind. And, and I'm thinking, why wouldn't he? He was with me. That struck me as I was preparing for this. I was like, okay, God's with me. <laughs> Good, I'm glad. I, I talk about it all the time, but, but he was actually there. And uh, when you don't have those navigational points, like to remember that sometimes, it's God bringing that to your mind. That's a beautiful picture of God's love for us. 
So today, as we look forward at the finish line, Joshua does not want his people to drift. We can easily drift off course. In the Navy, before there was GPS, they used the sextant, as I said, they shoot the stars, and they would do it. Jerry Bridges said this. He was in his 70s. He said he was in the Navy. They used to shoot it twice a day, and oftentimes they had to correct the course of the ship because they would get off course and be way off course. And so it's a, it's a something that we need and that, that is mentioned to Joshua that we, we hear all the time, that we need a personal communion with God. So the question is, do you have that personal communion with God? Joshua did. That's how he began. He started out, and God starts out with him with this navigational point that he says to him to keep the law. Keep the law. Meditate on it day and night. Keep it on your, in your mouth. Do not depart from it. Keep it on your lips. Turn it over. Meditate on it in your mind. And so we need daily course corrections from God. So we need that daily time with God's word. And God will give us that navigational fix, if you will, for our lives so that we do not drift off course if we're going to endure to the end. So Paul's about to give us or I'm sorry, Joshua is about to give us four navigational fixed points Um, as he's about to lay down the mantle. As we go back to chapter 24, he says he will help us stay on course. And the first one is God's redeeming love. God rescues his people, and it's important for us to know that. So we see here he's reminding the people of God's redemptive stories. And what he does is in the first part of Joshua chapter 24, He gives the people uh, uh, something to reflect on, the blessings, if you will, reflecting on God's redeeming love. When we think about that, um, we see that in this picture. Look where he takes them. He takes them, it says in verse 1 there, he gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and he summoned the elders and the heads and the judges and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. So he's bringing the the leaders, so that they can press it out to the people. But notice where he brings them. Have you ever had someone meet you at a specific place to help you to remember something, something significant? Or they take you back to where something significant happened? If you remember, these people were recommitted. They had a covenant here, but it goes all the way back to Abraham. Abraham walked up onto Shechem after God told him he was going to bless Abraham and he was going to bless the world through Abraham. That he made a covenant with Abraham at Shechem. So it's important for us to remember that covenant, and it's being carried on. So Joshua is reminding the people that God the Lord has done great things, and he says, meditate on the God's word. And we think about Shechem was the location where Abram stopped at the tree of Morah and received God's promise of the land. Shechem became part of the promised land of Israel. It was a place of commitment, a place of promise, a place of worship. And so it's important for, he didn't just bring them to any place. He brings brings them to Shechem to talk about God's covenant, to continue on, that God will continue carrying on through his people, this covenant that he first began with Abraham. Now Joshua begins reminding them of three major pictures of redemption. The first one's in verse 2. He says, Abram's name was changed to Abraham. God called Abraham from his home in Ur of the Chaldees, an area steeped in our idolatry. So God reminds the people through Joshua that Abraham is saved out of Ur where they served other gods. Why was Abraham saved out of Ur? Well, if you notice that it says there they served other gods, how was Abraham saved out of the land of idolatry? He'd never heard of God, the living God. God called him out of there. God revealed himself to him as a special act of grace. He is saved by grace out of there. Romans says he's saved by faith through grace. It is God's will for Abraham to be saved. It is his grace. He knew nothing of the living God. Abraham is served by God. He is saved by grace. By faith, Abraham was saved to embrace the true and living God. You know, it says that he saves us by grace out of darkness, that we're blind. We're darkened into our understanding, and then God calls us to himself. He opens our eyes by grace. The second picture is that Israel is saved out of Egypt. You remember that? 
Israel was saved out of Egypt by these miracles that he saved them. But the last thing was the blood of the lamb. They had to put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost, on the lintel, and they had to go in. And it didn't depend on whether how good or, or bad they were. They didn't, it wasn't to a degree. God didn't go inside. He just looked for the blood of the lamb. We're saved by blood, aren't we? We're saved by blood. Israel is saved out of Egypt. In the next few chapters or verses there, it shows God talking about Egypt, being taking the people out of Egypt. If you look in chapter 24 and you look over the first couple of verses there, it says in, in verse 2, it says, And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, and they served other gods. And then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river, and led him through all the land of Canaan, and made it his offspring, and it gave him Isaac, and Isaac Jacob, and Esau. And I gave Esau the hill country, and Seir to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. And I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of it. And afterwards, I brought you out. How did he bring him out of Egypt? He brought him out by the blood of the lamb. The Lord gave him the lamb, a spotless lamb. A lamb without blemish. God saved the people out of Egypt by the blood of the lamb. And he saves us by the blood of his son. The lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And then he talks about saving the people out of the wilderness. As you continue to read and through that, he talks about taking them through the wilderness. Out of the wilderness. After he plagued Egypt. He takes them into the wilderness. In verse 7, it says, When they cried to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and made the sea come upon them and covered them. Your eyes saw what I did in Egypt, and you lived in the wilderness for a long time. So he saved them out of Egypt, but how did he save them out of the wilderness? He saved them out of, wilderness, out of the wilderness by his power. So what he's doing is reminding them of God's redeeming love that he rescues people. How does he rescue people? Well, he saves them by grace. Secondly, he saves us by the blood of the lamb. And third, he saves us by his power. And he's saying that that's a navigational point. This is a point for you to remember. He's recalling it. It's important for us to remember God's word and redeeming love and that his providence is there for us to rely on, that we need to remember God's redeeming love and we need to remember God's divine providence. That God is with the people. As you see in the verses, in verse 8 there, he says, I brought you out of the land of the Amorites. Notice they said, they fought with you, but I gave them into your hand in verse 8. I destroyed them before you. God is telling that I did it. In verse 10 he says, I would not listen to Balaam. Indeed, he blessed you, so I delivered you out of his hand. As we think about God delivering us, he delivers us out of the hand. Verse 12, I sent the hornet in which you drove them out before you, the two kings of the Amorites, in verse 12. It was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you the land which you had not labored and the cities that you did not build. You eat the fruit of the vineyards and the olive orchards that you did not plant. I did that. I gave you the land. In verse 17, if you go down a little further, and I don't have it up here, but he says, For it is the Lord our God who brought us out, who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who did those great signs in the sight and preserved us in all the ways that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. See, it was important for him to help the people to remember, to not forget that it is God who redeems us. It is God who provides his providence, his protection, his presence with us. Because we forget. Like I did. Like I was shocked by the thing of thinking, why would, well, God reminded me of that. God's with me. And that was striking to me. I preached this stuff. But actually, I got, I got out there on the ocean and I got hit. And like we get hit sometimes by something shocking something that challenges us, something that is, is hard to deal with, and we are shocked by it, and we find ourselves with no point of reference, of a sense of we know God, 
but we don't know, we need help, God. We need to find our way back. And so God gives us these points of reference. And that's what's important here is that's why Joshua is talking to these people this way. The word has not departed from his mouth. And that he's recalling. God tells the people over and over again, don't forget me when you get in the land. And he's reminding them of God's providence. He redeems his people. He provides for his people protection, security, and he helps them persevere. And it's important for us to remember that if he delivered them, he will deliver us. You see, that's what they're supposed to remember. How did he do it? He brings them out. He brings them out of the land with his providence. But most importantly, that we learned this from last week with Dan when he was preaching, this 2314, he says, now I'm about to go the way of all the earth, and you know in your hearts and souls and all of you that not one word has failed. Of all the good things that the Lord your God has promised concerning you. In other words, all the things at Shechem that I've talked to Abraham about and that I talked to you about, about your recommitment, that you're coveting with the Lord, that I, not one word has failed. I told you I would be with you. I told you that no one would stand in your way, that I could bring you through this, this land. I could bring you through these battles and that I will do it. And I did do it. And God is saying, not one word has failed. All you have come, all have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. Now, if you think about that, we are told in the Bible that his word does not come back void. In other words, that it will accomplish what it set out to do. That his word will accomplish what it's set out to do. That if we keep it on our lips and we meditate on our minds so that we're, why did he tell Joshua to keep it on his lips and meditate on his mind? So that you may be careful to do it, to trust in it, to act upon it, to meditate on it in your mind and to keep it on your lips. So be careful to do all that is according to written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Understanding that hearing without heeding is vain. Hearing without heeding is vain. And so Joshua warned them of three consequences if they don't, are unfaithful to their commitment to the Lord. And they're found in Joshua 23. So I'm going to go back. I hope that doesn't mess you up a little bit, but I want to go back. And if you have your Bibles, look back in verse 11, because he says to them, be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. You know, that's what he said in Joshua 22. Remember, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Serve him and him only that he will never leave you or forsake you. Isn't that what Jesus said the greatest commandment is for us? To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor. And he says to them, be careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. But because of why? Look what it says in verse um, 12. It says, for if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these, of these nations. Listen to how he says it. You cling to the remnant of the nations. Instead of clinging to the Lord, you're clinging to the remnant of of the nations and remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you. So Joshua is warning them, don't accommodate, don't, don't start accommodating the world's ways into your lifestyle. The gods of this world, the gods of pleasure has many forms. Do not accommodate the perversions. I don't care if the person has a degree from Yale. If they tell you that a man can get pregnant, a biological man, it's not true. It's a lie. You don't need a degree to tell people that. But what you've got people from these large institutions standing up in front of Congress and trying to say this without any question. And so God says to the people, don't go and cling to the to the world's ways, to the culture that's out there. And then make marriages with them. Because if you do, if you marry yourself to that, you're going to be infected by it. You're going to be impacted by it. Because of accommodation, accommodating the perversion. You're going to lose your moorings, your navigational points. That God says, I created you in my image, male and female. In the beginning, God created. That's where we're from. We come, we're created by God. And defined by God. 
And so God says here that if you turn back from the Lord, look what it says in verse 12. If you turn back and cling to the remnant. In other words, not loving God. You cling and you love the world. There are consequences. If you turn back. It, it, it's, it's, if you turn back, look what verse 13 says. Know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. You'll live with them. And look what happens to you. They shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish off the good ground that the Lord your God has given you. My friend, that Joshua says to the people, there are three consequences. There's a failure to love the Lord your God will result. In verse 13, it says defeat. God will no longer drive out the nations. Discomfort. You'll live with the problems. And then the third thing is disgrace. Until you perish from the good land that the Lord your God has given you. Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings defeat. Discomfort and disgrace. Joshua just said, not one word has failed. It was not by your sword or by your bow. I give you this land. Trust in me. Remember God's redeeming love. Remember God's providence, his protection, and his provision for you. If he delivered them, he'll deliver you. And then here, he keeps his promises. Not one of them failed. Do we need to hear that sometimes when we're out on the sea trying to find our way? I think, I think we need it today. I mean, do you hear people saying there is no morality? Do you hear that now they want to have, they're saying there's no immorality. And so if you get rid of immorality, you might as well do away with morality. You see how clever they are. But see, God says there is a way. There, do not let the word of God depart from your mouth. Do not let it leave your lips Meditate it on your mind so that you're careful to obey it because if it's in you, it'll come out of you and it'll be expressed out and God's word will come from him. He will bring it to your heart and out of your mouth. And so it's, it's, you, you see here, he's telling the people, don't accommodate him. There's a remnant that's out there there's, that's going to try to sway you the world's way. And God says, don't accommodate them. There's a consequence. So you need to trust in God keeps his promises. His word has not failed. So today, if you stand here before God and these witnesses, he says to them, choose this day whom you will serve. So he says, make a choice. That's what he says. And that's the way I feel like he says it. He goes, he goes choose this day then. Because he, and, he, and he says something very interesting. If you're going to finish well, you, have, you, need to have the, you need to begin with the end in mind, your preferred future, right? What do you want your life to turn out to be? And God's saying, finish well. So today as you stand before God and you think about this, choose this day whom you will serve. God tells us to keep the book of the law always on your lips, meditate on it day and night. That's what shapes your life. Your commitment to the Word of God will impact your life and on your marriage. The Word of God, your commitment to the Word of God will impact your marriage. The Word of God will impact the people that you're around, your friends, your neighbors, your relatives. The Word of God will impact the people that you work with. It will shape things if we will trust it. And we will let it navigate, help us to navigate, to have those fixed points of references so we don't get off course. How in the world do we wind up here tell, having people telling us men can get pregnant with a serious straight face? And kids don't know who they are. We have lost our navigational points. Our reference is from God. And so we are accommodating the world. And that's not the way to win the world, God said. The way to win the world is to proclaim the word of God. People's lives will be transformed if we're careful to do everything written in the word of God. God says, I'll go with you. Be strong. Be courageous. Because you're going to need it. If you want to finish well, the starting point was Joshua 1, 8, and 9. Right? 
That's what we just talked about. Here's the ending point. Serve him with sincerity. This is important for us to remember. When we think about serving God with sincerity, think about the word sincerity. Insincerity is the opposite of sincerity. They used to mark things called insincero. They used to put wax on statues. And sometimes they'd mark it with insincero without wax so they, that you knew that it was true. It was completely flawless. But if it had wax in it, you'd have to hold it up to the light. That's what revealed the flaw because the light would come through the wax. But if the marble was flawless, the light wouldn't come through it. Anyways, serve him with sincerity and in faithfulness as opposed to insincerity and unfaithfulness. And Joshua speaks to the people, and he listen, they listen to his words, and it says they will shape your destiny. They will shape the people around you. And so we will impact other people if we'll be faithful to the word of God. Serve him with sincerity and faithfulness. The second thing is the part about acting, heeding and, and, and working and doing. Heeding and doing. Putting away your false gods. Apparently they'd kept some of them. And he told them to put them away. He says, get rid of that stuff. Act upon your faith. The third thing is choose this day whom you will serve. And so as we think about that, the people said, for three times they said, we will serve the Lord. Verse 16, verse 21, verse 24. Verse 16, they said, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Look what he says there before he says, choose this day. In verse 15, he says, and if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, at least in my my translation, it's a, where people would interpret that it's evil to serve the Lord. He said, then choose this day whom you will serve. You want the God of the Amorites? You go serve them. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a very interesting statement, isn't it? He says, as for me and my house, my family, my household, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to walk in his ways. We're going to, we're going to meditate on the word of God. He offers us unshakable peace and an inestimable privilege as well as his protection. And God still does that for his people today. An unshakable peace, an inestimable privilege to serve him faithfully and sincerity to put away those, those things that are not of him. Don't try to accommodate them. Choose this day whom you will serve, he's saying. But as for me, he says, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. <laughs> We're going to have to stop. But I have such a, it's an, ama- it's an amazing picture here. Look what it says at the end of Joshua. It says there in 29, after these things, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old, and they buried him in his own inheritance at Timnath, Sarah, which is in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua. And then it says something interesting. All the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had knowing all the work of the Lord did for Israel. What he's pointing out was that the people that remembered God's redeeming love, God's providence, his protection, and his preservation, that he's the one that got them through it. It wasn't in their own strength. And God's promises. Those people that remember, they served the Lord all the days of those people's lives because they didn't let it go. They clung to it. You turn over one page and one page in your Bible to Judges, and we see the people fall away because they lost their way. My friend, don't lose your way. Cling to God. Love God with all your heart and soul and mind and body. Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this passage. We ask, Lord, for you to help us as we think about this book, that it shows us ourself. 
and it shows us our Savior. Joshua was the captain of the people. He is a type of Christ. And it is in Christ who we trust to lead us home. Just as Joshua led the people into the promised land, into Canaan, Jesus leads us home to heaven that we're kept by his grace and mercy. Father, I pray for each one here as we think about what what you're doing in our life through Joshua. We pray that you'd help us to remember of your redemptive love, of your preservation of, of our lives, your providence, and your promises that not one of them, not one of them has failed. And that includes your promise to forgive us of our sins, to trust in our Savior and be saved and take hold of eternal life, that we can fight the good fight, that we can remember that we can finish well, that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, that we stand between the two mountains, Mount Calvary and Mount Olive, where Jesus died for our sins at Calvary and wait for his return at the Mount of Olives. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I just want to uh, thank the worship team for reminding us today that we are a child of God. What a great reminder that is. I also want to remember the people who were in those storms. Ian has wreaked, wreaked havoc and just for people who just feel like their whole world has been torn and pushed upside down. So uh, let's pray for them real quick and then hear our word of benediction. Father God, we do pray for families, friends, and neighbors and relatives who have lost everything. Lord, we pray for your help for the church to stand strong, to stand out as a beacon in the night. Lord, help us to get down and help. Help us to put many hands to lots of work. Help us to bring and restore people and restore their lives, and mainly restore them to Jesus Christ, to remember his redemptive love and his providence, even in the midst of the storm. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power of work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.